All right, if you take your Bibles and turn to the book of Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14. We left off last week. We uh, past couple of weeks we have been studying the introduction to the book of Exodus. We learned that the word Exodus is talking about the children of Israel's exit out of Egypt. We have seen how Pharaoh is a type of Satan, the god of this world, and Egypt being a type of the world over which Satan rules, the fallen world system that is, as Jesus called him, the god of this world when he was here on earth. Now we've also seen how that this is a picture uh, of the children of Israel as they're led out of Egypt and they're delivered from the bondage that they have been born into. It is a picture of you and me, how we are delivered through the bondage of sin, Satan, and death through the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week we looked at the Passover and we saw how that Passover lamb, his blood was shed and it was applied to that door of the house and those people hid behind that door and took refuge in the house that was marked with the blood of the Lamb and how that is a picture of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. How we take what Jesus did on the cross and we, as they applied it to that door, we apply what he did on the cross to our account. And uh, we thank God for that. Even as the Apostle Paul told the church, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And I thank God for that. Now today, uh, we're going to go ahead and go a little bit further in the story. And we're going to see how Israel uh, ultimately made it out of Egypt. And we're going to see how that corresponds to, again, to our salvation in the work of Jesus Christ. Exodus chapter 14 is where we are today. Ultimately, the Passover uh, ultimately broke the back of Pharaoh. When God slew the firstborn in the houses of Egypt, uh, Pharaoh was not a believer. His door was not marked with the blood of the Passover lamb. So God slew Pharaoh's firstborn even as he told Moses to warn Pharaoh in the very beginning, when he says, You shall tell Pharaoh, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And thus says the Lord, Let my son go that he may serve me, or I will slay your son, even your firstborn. And that's what God did. Pharaoh's firstborn son is now slain. He has had his back broken through the, the Passover judgment. And now he has granted permission. And the people of Egypt have even asked, and they're now begging, leave. Now the children of Israel have been set free from bondage. But not so fast, because uh, Pharaoh ultimately changes his mind. And he says, why have we let these people go? Why in the world have we uh, uh, made the decision to let these people go from our grip while well, they need to be back here serving us. Even after all the devastation that God had dealt to the nation of Israel through all the plagues and through the death of Pharaoh's firstborn son, his heart was so hardened against God that he pursued after the Israelites as they were leaving the land of Egypt. We'll pick up now in Exodus chapter 14 and let's look here, if you would, in verse 9. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen, his army, and overtook them, encamping by the sea. Now here they are. They're encamped by the sea. And if you'll uh, look over here, and I, I realize that this uh, is probably not the best image quality for you on this map. But uh, right here is the land of Egypt. Here is the promised land, okay? Here's the promised land that uh, Israel is uh, going into. And, but here's this, this sea right here that stands in between them and the promised land. You see it, it uh, flows in from here and, and it opens up wider and wider and wider. This is the Sinai Peninsula. This is where... Uh, Moses here uh, 
met God at the burning bush. Okay, just to give you a little, uh, little uh, geography there. And so now they're in between Egypt over here, but they're caught up here at this sea. And it may not look very big here on the map, but uh, uh, it would be a, a long way to walk through. So there's a wall of water here, and there are, is a wall of Egyptian soldiers and chariots on the other side, and the Israelites are caught in between both of them. And they're overpowered. They're not armed with weapons and chariots and horses and things like that to go to battle uh, as, uh, as Egypt is. Uh, as far as the, the flesh, they are well uh, outranked here. The Egyptians are going to overpower them in the flesh. But God, remember, is delivering them out of that grip. You see, Satan doesn't want to let go. He doesn't, he doesn't want to loosen his grip. And he's going to do everything he can to keep God from saving his people. And God is allowing this to happen to show you and me just how powerful our salvation is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we'll go ahead and go down a little bit further in Exodus chapter 14 and we'll see what happens. Basically what happens is, is this, God told Moses, now you take that rod, the rod you've been doing all those miracles with, uh, your, your walking stick that you have, you take that rod, Moses, and I want you to stretch that rod out over the Red Sea. And when you do, I'm going to open that Red Sea up so you can cross over. So listen to what happened now in Exodus 14, verse 21. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. So God just split that sea open, had that wind come through and dry the land up so they wouldn't be walking on muddy ground. And he opened that up, and there was a wall on this side of water and a wall on that side of water. And uh, he opened it up miraculously and with power. And it says here, And the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea. You see in verse 21, uh, verse 22 it says, And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. So now there's a, a chase. God has opened up the way. All the, uh, the Egyptians thought the Israelites were trapped. They thought, oh, we'll get them good now. They won't be able to escape our grip now. That Passover... That Passover sacrifice, that's not going to do it for them. We're still going to hang on to them. We have this one last chance to keep Israel from escaping our grip. But look what God did. What the Egyptians thought would prevent the Israelites from ultimately escaping, that is the Red Sea. God ultimately just opened it up and made it no obstacle at all and the children of Israel walk through that Red Sea on dry ground. And here comes the Egyptians. They're chasing after them. They're going through the midst of that sea too. The water's standing on each side of them miraculously. And let's look and see what happens. And it came to pass that in the morning watch the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud. That's what God was in. He was in the pill, a pillar of, uh, of a cloudy pillar of fire at night and pillar of, of cloud by day. And he remained over the Israelites and they followed him. And it says here that and uh, God troubled the host of the Egyptian and took off their chariot wheels that they dragged them heavily so that the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the 
morning appeared and the Egyptians fled against it and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea and the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea against them. There remained not so much as one of them. What's happening here? God opens up the sea. It's a long journey through and they travel through that sea as it's divided on either side. And the Israelites, they make it through. We read uh, more in Scripture. We don't have time for this lesson, but God had put a wall. Uh, uh, he had put a, a, a big fog, like you could say, between uh, the Egyptians and the Israelites. And they couldn't see what was going on until the Israelites were going to be clean escape from uh, Egypt and then God lifted that and then allowed the Egyptians to pursue after them but the Israelites had such a lead such a head start on them that by the time the Egyptians got all the way into the middle of the the sea God knocked their chariot wheels off so the chariots got stuck and they couldn't uh, they couldn't go anywhere and then God waited till the Israelites got all the way through and then God closed the waters back and drowned the Egyptians in the sea and as we just read, the Bible says there was not so much as one of their enemies left. Oh, listen, dear friend. Again, this is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, that last thing, that last thing that Pharaoh thought he could have, oh, that Red Sea would trap them for sure. They couldn't get past that. They could take the Israelites back. The Passover, the sacrifice, would not alone allow them to escape. You see, and that's kind of like the grave is for us. Oh, yes, Christ died for our sins on the cross. Yes, he has become our Passover. And we don't have to go to hell, thank God for that. But then there's that grave that we die and we go into. And how can you overcome death? How can a man who's died make his way back to God? Well, see, that's answered through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that Jesus came that through death he might destroy him that hath the power of death, that is, the devil. And through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has made a way where you and I can come to him and be saved. Christ's death, his burial, his resurrection. They have opened up the wall that separates us and driven away for us to escape from Pharaoh's grip and metaphorically from Satan's grip. And so he's made a way for us to clean escape. And look what happens once they went through that wall, through that sea, God closed that sea back up and swallowed up all of their enemies. Now here they were, if you could just imagine this with me right now. They are now on the other side of the Red Sea. And the Red Sea has now become a partition between the Israelites and the Egyptians. It's a partition. Now, the Israelites, they couldn't make it across. Oh, perhaps they could have come down where it's really, really narrow and, and uh, got through there uh, uh, somehow through some type of passageway. But where they were at the time, they couldn't make it through. Not, not naturally. But now they're on the other side. And the same goes for them. Now they can't get back, you see. And now this Red Sea has become a partition between Egypt and the Promised Land. And now they look at that sea and they can see probably the floating bodies washing ashore of their enemies. And they can see how that Red Sea has completely destroyed, as the scripture says, all of them. Not one of them was left. And now that Red Sea is a barrier between them and the world they once knew. You see, the Apostle Paul says, God forbid that I should glory, 
save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. You see, that's exactly what we see here. As they're standing on the other side of that Red Sea, it is as if Moses and all the children of Israel could look and say, God forbid that we should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom Egypt is crucified unto us, and us unto Egypt. And I thank God for that. So the journey moves forward. Here they are now on the other side of that Red Sea. And here is the church in the wilderness, as, as the uh, Bible puts it in the book of Acts. And they're moving forward. There's no restaurants there in the wilderness. The wilderness is a rough place. And as they continue to move forward, they run into some obstacles. We're going to look at them, a couple of them. Uh, God willing, this morning now. The first thing, or one of the things that they ran into, and there were there were a few things they ran into, but one of the things that they ran into was going to be a lack of food, a lack of food. Okay, and if you'll go ahead and take your uh, your Bibles now and turn uh, to chapter sixteen, chapter sixteen. And what happened was, as they got out there, the, the children of Israel, they, they became very hungry. And uh, they didn't have the food that they needed. Uh, at this point, you know, when the Israelites went in, there were about 70 people, the Bible says. Originally, when Joseph and uh, all of his brethren, his father and all, when they went in, there were about 70. But when they came out, after all these years, uh, historians estimate there were about two and a half million, okay, after they grew and multiplied and multiplied all the years passed by. It's a very large company of people. It takes a lot of food, a lot of sustenance to feed those people, logistically speaking. This was a very uh, problematic situation for Israel. So they cried unto God, and uh, or actually in the Moses they were complaining and Moses cried unto God and God said Moses here's what I'm going to do I'm going to make bread rain down from heaven alright now let's go ahead and look at this it says here in uh, Exodus chapter 16 God said in verse 12 I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel speaking to them saying at even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. And it shall come to pass that at even the quails came up and covered the camp. So in the evening, uh, birds, quails came up, they covered the camp. In the morning, dew lay round about the host. Now, this is what we're going to concentrate on now is this dew. And when the dew that lay was gone up, Behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoar frost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. This, and Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. <laughs> this, is, this is so interesting. God gave them quail to eat that night. Well, they knew what quail were. They've eaten quail before, I'm sure. They dressed it, and roasted it, and ate it. But in the morning, something different happened. In the morning, the dew that was on the, the grass or the ground, as it evaporated, there was this very thin, small, round thing, like frost, sort of like, on the ground. And they looked and they said, it's manna. Now, manna basically means, what is this? <laughs> so they named it manna because they didn't know what it was. And it was, it was like a seed. It, it don't, don't get in your mind that manna was like these little puffy pieces of bread you just pick up and put in your mouth. It was like seed, and that they would grind that up and make uh, flour out of it. Then they could break, bake their bread. And uh, uh, so that's what they were harvesting here basically off the ground was this manna and God said this is the bread the food that I have given you to eat and so they ate manna every day from there on out there in the wilderness now this is interesting because what's happening here all of this is a picture 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, in John chapter 6, the Bible gives us some really good insight on this. Jesus spoke of this manna. Let me turn there for you real quick. In John chapter 6, and listen to what Jesus told the children of Israel. It says in verse 32, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. So Jesus is speaking to them. He's using this illustration to explain himself. He said, look, Moses didn't give you that bread from heaven. When, when your forefathers were out in the wilderness and that bread fell down from, from heaven to the ground, that manna, that wasn't Moses giving you that bread. That was God. And God is trying to give you the true bread today because the real bread that God gives you to eat is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life unto the world. And they said, Lord, give us this bread. Oh, they wanted that bread. Give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them in verse 35, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. You see, Jesus went on to explain in John chapter 6. He said, My flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood has everlasting life. He said, The bread that I will give, he said, is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. You see, Jesus is the true manna. He is the bread that came down from heaven to give life unto the world. And we take that bread and we eat it. Jesus said, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. A lot of people don't understand what that means. But my children, one day I was talking to them about salvation. And I said, uh, what would happen if you, uh, if you didn't eat? They said, well, we would die. I said, well, let's say that you have gone for weeks and weeks without eating, and you're so frail, and you're, 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 you're passing away, and I rush you to the emergency room. And the doctor looks at you. The doctor says, when's the last time they've eaten? I said, oh, it's been weeks. The doctor says, well, sir, that's their problem. They have to eat, or they're going to die. And I say, doctor, no problem. I'll take care of that right now. And I run down the grocery store and I just pack my shopping cart full of groceries. And then I run those groceries to the house and I'm rushing and I stop the pantries full of groceries. And I rush back to the hospital and I say, Doctor, I have plenty of groceries now. How are the kids doing now? And the doctor would say, Why, sir, they have to eat the food. It's not going to do them any good in the pantries that food has to be eaten and I say doctor I'll take care of it and I rush home and I fix a big meal and I and I eat as much as I can and I rush back to the emergency room I say doctor the food has been eaten now I'm stuffed how are my children by this time my children are beginning to giggle and they said daddy we have to eat that food ourselves it won't help us if you eat it. And that's when I explain to my children, honey, it's the same way with Jesus. You have to take Jesus yourself. It's not enough that Dad has. And that's what Jesus is trying to say. He said, He is the bread that came down from heaven. It's true. Just as the, the manna fell down from the sky and laid upon the ground, it would do them no good. Though the whole ground was full of the manna, it would do the people no good unless they individually picked it up for themselves and ate it. Although there was life in the bread, there would not be life in them unless they took that in for themselves. 
And although Jesus has been crucified on the cross, and although many, like myself, have partaken of what he has done for me and have received that for our salvation, it will do you no good unless you take that for yourself, unless you eat that bread, that life he's given for you when he gave his flesh as a sacrifice for your sin. He is the bread that came down from heaven to give life unto the world. Well, they were all so thirsty. There was water that they needed to drink. So what did God do? God provided water. Interestingly enough, he provided it from a rock. Exodus chapter 17, verse 5. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee of the elders of Israel, and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river. Take it, take in thine hand, and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb. And thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Oh, wow. So now the, the children of Israel, they're needing water. They're needing water. God didn't tell Moses to go dig a hole and make a well. God didn't send down rain. God told Moses, you take that stick, you take that rod, you go strike that rock. And when you strike that rock, water's going to come out. Oh, listen. Don't you see? It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Jesus is the rock that's been smitten for you. And through him being smitten on our behalf, he gives life-giving water so we can drink and live. I like what the book of Revelation says. He that is a thirst says, let him come and take the water of life freely. Now I paraphrase that. But that's what the book of Revelation says, to come and take the water of life freely. Jesus said, when he was in, on earth, he said, any, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. You see, that's what this rock is all about. Jesus is the rock smitten for you and for me. And once he was smitten, listen, that water gushed out. And those people, they came and they had uh, water to drink for them and their cattle. And it sustained them in the wilderness. And I'll tell you what, Jesus Christ will sustain you and me as well. He is the rock smitten for us through which the water of life comes out and gives life unto the world. And again, as he said, my flesh is meat indeed. My blood is drink indeed. All of these are pictures of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul goes on to explain that when the children of Israel came out of the, 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 out of the land of Egypt, he goes on to explain that that was a picture of Jesus Christ. He said they ate that same spiritual bread and they drank of that same spiritual rock that followed them. Which rock, the Apostle Paul said, is Christ. Thank you and God bless. And we'll, Lord willing, we'll continue our series as we follow the children of Israel in the wilderness. Lord willing, next week, we'll watch them as they come up to Mount Sinai and we'll have the lesson of the preparation for the giving of the Ten Commandments. Thank you.